Okay, hi back everybody. Um, in the next session we wanted to start with some stuff we know about the stakeholders, some stakeholder requirements. And we, we, we put three studies, three papers into 30 minutes and from these 30 minutes, 10 minutes are gone. So there will be a heavy session, uh, very condensed. Um, just write down what you have some questions and uh, you can find the papers online and you can ask us later on because I especially want to give a focus on the last session where Maren did a study about quality indicators for learning analytics. Um, we do later on so I will rush a bit through the slides but everything is online, uh, the content is there. Um, so from the Open University and from our Open Learning Analytics cluster, what we are doing, uh, we have this framework of learning analytics. And this framework is for us a kind of guiding instrument what learning analytics is, uh, which stakeholders are involved, what are objectives of learning analytics, like reflection, prediction, educational data, technologies, constraints and competences. And from the Open University and from the Technology and Learning Program, we are working towards this uh, framework. Um, so you can find that also online and slides about that. Um, um, what do we know about stakeholders? So we have some experience we did with this, along this framework. We did a study in uh, 2012 with international stakeholders. Um, then we did an impact of learning analytics in the Netherlands within the SurfSIG last year in 2013. So there we did a group concept mapping study um, where, and also a master class, so it was a longer tri trajectory, uh, where we looked for the impact of learning analytics in the Netherlands. And then the new study is about quality indicators, um, how you can measure the impact of analytics on your teaching. Um, so that's what we know. Uh, about stakeholder studies. Um, so there are three papers. Uh, I will show this slide between each of the studies. Um, so you can find these uh, papers or the preprint of it under the bit.ly links. And uh, for this study I'm presenting now, there's also the questionnaires and the data online. So if there are some questions we did not investigate, maybe you can use the data set and investigate it your own, uh, on your own. Um, so the first stakeholder survey study in 2012 uh, was a four-week study. Uh, 156 people um, have participated and provided valuable um, information after cleaning. And we have 121 uh, full records. Some of them did not finalize the whole survey. Um, from the participants that have been pa participated, well, it was major uh, movement was 2012 from higher education. In the K-12 sector, so school sector, not too many people were already on learning analytics working. At least they did not participate in our survey and some vocational and some other people. Uh, we identified different roles of people within that survey. So teachers needs, researchers, learning uh, designers um, and managers and they expressed their um, view on learning analytics across the different dimensions. So it was an international study, so we pushed it to different channels and um, different mailing lists and whatever we, we could reach people. And you see, well, it's quite a Western topic. At least we did get did not, no, no submission from Russia, China, or African people, so there are some limitations to this study. Um, but this is the Netherlands, so there's quite some data about the Netherlands um, and the UK and America. What we find then from the stakeholder, analy analytic, uh, stakeholder survey was, um, who was, there was questions, I just put some of these topics now, not the whole thing, you can find it in the paper. Uh, who was expected to benefit the most from learning analytics? Um, and then the people could make their choice between teachers, also parents, institutions and learners. Well, and obviously, teachers and learners are the main stakeholders for learning analytics, and institutions and parents have been uh, rated less important for learning analytics um, from the survey study in 2012. Um, then we asked for objectives. So what are the most important objectives for learning analytics um, to the stakeholders? And there was the op option reflection prediction to unveil hidden information in the data. And uh, then reflection support and unveiling information uh, was the most important and actually prediction was not really something that these stakeholders saw as a core task of learning analytics. Well, it's quite surprising. 
Um, regarding constraints, uh, we had different things where they could express their constraints and Im the effect of learning analytics on these uh, constraints. And um, well, there were some um, privacy and ethics, there's the typical things that also Gaba presented in the slides before. There's a lot of issues about that. But actually, data ownership, data openness, and transparency of the data, they, the stakeholders expected that learning analytics will have a big effect on these three topics. And that's also what we see with the learning record store. Uh, the data should be owned by the learners. Who actually owns the data? Does the university own it or the student? So these kind of questions um, were anticipated by the participants. And then there was another interesting insight for competences. So we asked him from the framework, what kind of competences do you expect are needed for really learning analytics rollout? And uh, we had seven different dimensions. Numerical still, IT skills, critical reflection, evaluation skills, and so on. And um, the people said then that the most important uh, competences for learning analytics are critical reflection at the teacher and the learner side, um, self-directness, so that you are kind of aware and you know what to do next. And they said that numerical skills and ethical think thinking are competences that are less important for learning analytics in the field. And there was one other comment, what was really interesting to see, actually 70% um, from the people believed that um, the learners or the students were not competent enough to independently learn from learning analytics. I, I found this really a strong thing. Yeah? You, we talk about learning analytics, self-directness, awareness, and so on, but most of them believe that the students will not be able to really yeah, steer their own learning and so on. So there's a lot of training need or it needs to be easier to get some reasons out of some, some, some evidence for your own learning. So that's the study we did in 2012. There, learning analytics was a really fresh topic. 2011, the first conference where, so things changed a bit in the meantime. Um, so then we, we just published that paper we did in 2013 about the impact of learning analytics on the Dutch education system. And this is what we did within the thick uh, learning analytics. So we did this group concept mapping study with, with people like you uh, at the SIG event and uh, asked them a specific focus uh, question. And um, the process looked like this. So um, we had a focus question where they need to answer, that they need to answer in the brainstorm session that we did at the SIG event. Um, then later on, over the summer, the people sorted the statements that were collected about the impact of learning analytics on the Dutch field. And they sorted them into uh, different clusters. Um, they organized these issues and they rated them on a one to five scale, how important these statements are and how feasible they are. And uh, yeah, in the end, we get done different uh, analysis out of that. So our uh, triggering question, maybe it's, it's the focus problem was, you should contribute one specific change that learning analytics will trigger in Dutch education. So one specific change uh, that, we, that you think learning analytics will give to the Dutch education system. And then, well, people sorted then the stuff in this uh, online environment. So it's really like post-its you put into one stack and to the other stack. Uh, and then you give ratings to these things, um, to each of the statements that have been contributed by the people that, the, that have been at the SIG event. And then you get, the, get these different uh, rating values. Well, and our hypothesis to this study was actually that um, the most important items, clusters, what we will get at the end, will be less feasible to be implemented in the Dutch education system. So that's some of the one of the experiences we have with this um, method that actually things that are really important are also hard to achieve. And we had one other hypothesis that was there will be a significant difference between novice participants, people that for the first time uh, came to the SIG event, and, and, and to more expert participants um, that know about learning analytics field already. So that's some of the statistics of the people. Um, you see, most of the people did not rate them as an expert, actually only 5%. So there was kind of balance between novice and advanced people. Um, they also expressed their expertise in the field, uh, in which domain they are involved, and the type of organization they are participating. What we get from this group concept mapping study is then first a point map. This point map is uh, 
the map that shows each item that you see here is one statement contributed from one of the participants. If these statements are close to each other, they have been clustered by the participants more often closely to each other. So they are semantically related. And then you already see that there are some topics emerging from this uh, point map. And then um, it works with hierarchical clustering. So you get then uh, a kind of groups. You have to decide on which level you want to see on this data. You want to look at the data, how many um, clusters you want to get. And then you get from this point map, uh, Yeah, you have to make a decision. What represents your data best? Which clusters? You can also have 16 of these clusters. Then it's very fragmented. Or you can go down to two or something, and you have one big uh, thing. So we said, OK, a cluster map of seven labels represents that data from the sick people um, best. And then we also looked into the statements that have been contributed. And we came up with these seven topics uh, that were identified that learning analytics will have an effect on the Dutch education system for these seven topics that have been identified. So student empowerment, personalization, feedback, performance, teacher empowerment, research and learning design, management, and risks. And you already see, you can really look at that like a map. So you already see in the south that they are, the students are here in the south, the teachers are in the north. And there's something in between like feedback and performance and personalization. Personalization is more for the student than for the teacher. Uh, feedback and performance is more for the teacher. So you can read that map already like this. And uh, yeah, management economics is here. Privacy is somehow separated uh, down there. Um, so then the importance rating come in. Uh, that's just, you see, that as, much, as more layers are available, as more important this, this cluster is rated. So all the, that's the average of all the ratings given to one statement. And um, then you see these different uh, clusters, and you see that the importance is actually much more on the, on the teacher empowerment, student empowerment, and management and economics and risk are less important, at least for the sick participants. And then we ask the same rating for feasibility. So what is feasible to do with learning analytics for the Dutch education system? And we get almost the same picture. So there's also um, management and risks are not that um, risky for, for implementing, actually. That was quite surprising. So getting back to the first hypothesis, that was the most important items, clusters, will be less feasible to be implemented in the Dutch education system, was actually uh, rejected. Because when we contrast now these data sets, two different data sets, um, so the rating on the clusters for importance against the rating of the clusters on feasibility. You see that the most important cluster, teacher empowerment, personalization, actually both get a very high rating on importance, but also a high rating on feasibility. So basically, that learning analytics can really have an effect in the Dutch education system to support teachers, to make better decisions, to be more informed, uh, but also to personalize uh, teaching. And quite surprising was management and risk really at the end um, of this comparison. So the people that attended the SIG last year, they, had, they thought kind of, yeah, there are risks, but they are not that dramatic that learning analytics will not be implemented in the, in the Netherlands. And uh, we had a second hypothesis. So there will be a significant difference between the novice participants compared to the expert participants on the rating on importance and feasibility again. And then we can split the data against the people that said, well, they are novices, they are not so informed about it. And the others are experts, so we added the experts and the advanced together. And then surprisingly, we got um, a very uh, high correlation between both. So actually, personalization and teacher empowerment both see them as um, feasible and can be implemented. So they both basically speak the same language. What was really a surprise to us, because any domain you go to is that you, when you have talk to experts, they know more about the field than a, a novice person. So there, there seems to be something. Um, that the people have a good uh, understanding and awareness of learning analytics and also the advantages and disadvantages of it. So that was quite surprising for us. And basically, when you reconsider this um, information, 
then um, the conclusions we took from this group concept mapping study is we need to reject our both hypothesis. Um, but the outcome basically is that, uh, that in the Netherlands you have quite a uh, shared understanding of learning analytics and its abilities and um, that the Dutch community highly agrees on topics that are important to influence the education system with the learning analytics. So basically, Netherlands are kind of ready to roll out learning analytics. This is what we get out of this study. There are limitations to add um, because we had to serve sick, we talked about the data, we exchanged knowledge. It's not that we put the people, um, asked them at the workplace, so they exchanged also ideas about it. But when we exchanged these ideas and we shared the knowledge about learning analytics, at the end we came up with this shared understanding of learning analytics in the Netherlands. What is quite an interesting result. Um, and then now for the last study that uh, Maron was doing, we wanted to ask, as we had got these high results, we wanted to ask the participants about quality indicators of learning analytics. This is a study we did uh, recently at the LAC 14 conference uh, in, where have they been, in Indianapolis, where we collected ind quality indicators with the same method. So we again, we asked people, what is um, a triggering, what is a, what is a quality indicator for measuring learning analytics? And then people contributed these indicators, clustered them into criteria clusters, and rated them again. And Maren will tell you a bit about the details about that. Okay, hi. Um, yeah, so as Hendrik already explained, we did the study uh, at least for the brainstorming during the LAC conference this year. And uh, in total, we got uh, 74 participants to, to take part, and they generated 92 ideas. We then cleaned up the statements a little bit, so we took out the doubles, etc. And uh, sometimes people basically had two statements in one, so we separated those. And in the end, we had 103 statements uh, left. After that, we uh, personally contacted 55 uh, learning analytics experts and asked them to please sort these statements and then also to rate them. And uh, as you can see in the table, uh, unfortunately, not all of them uh, replied, but we had uh, a number um, of uh, around 23, 21 people that actually rated, sorted uh, these statements. Uh, the process uh, is the same as in the study that Henrik already just explained. So in the first, we got the point map. And uh, as you can see here as well, you have some of the areas that are very densely clustered. So those statements are semantically quite related. And there are some areas that are kind of vast and open and the statements are a little bit more loose. And um, we also came up with uh, a cluster map. And uh, as you can see here, um, we have kind of really the data layer on top, so both clusters that are related to data at, in some format are at the very, uh, very top. Then in the middle you have kind of uh, anything that is related to either outcome or learning processes in general. So you have support statements, um, learning outcome statements, uh, what is important to that. On the outside you have also a little bit about acceptance and uptake. I'll come to that a bit in a bit uh, later. And um, on the bottom, you have anything related to people. So either teachers, students, or how they perform. So how, they, how the humans actually um, react. Um, we also, um, of course, have the rating maps. And as you can see here, uh, the layer on the very left, the acceptance and uptake layer, um, had a very, very low importance um, rating. And the most important ones were the ones related to students, um, data privacy, and the uh, learning support and outcome. So the middle and the basically the middle belt and the uh, eastern part of this uh, cluster map. And if you look at the rating map for feasibility, the picture is a little bit similar. So the acceptance and uptake again. Um, wasn't really taken into account. People thought this is not very feasible. And it was also when you looked at the statements in this specific cluster, it was kind of like a ragback sort of thing. So any cluster that any statement that couldn't really fit into any of the other clusters somehow ended up in this one big. And as you can see, the, the, the size of the cluster is also quite wide. Um, what is interesting to see, though, is that the data privacy um, cluster is deemed very feasible by people and also very important. 
And um, what we noticed, which is visible on the pattern match scale here, um, is that especially the student awareness cluster is deemed quite important, but much less feasible than the ones uh, about data or learning support or outcome. Um, here on the importance, you can see there's quite a very many on top, and they're very close together, almost on one dot. Uh, on the feasibility scale, this drops a lot. So um, here we have, it's not as equal uh, as in the study that Hendrik presented before. Um, another uh, image I would like to show you is a so-called GoZone graph. It maps the um, individual statements, so there you don't have the clusters anymore, but the individual statements of importance and feasibility. So there is some sort of relation that if a statement is important, it is most likely also somewhat feasible, as you can see that there is a movement towards the top, and the top right quadrant is the yes feasible and yes important cluster um, statement box. So um, kind of when you compare the two maps, um, we've t we took out the, uh, the acceptance and uptake cluster because we thought it was so lowly rated by uh, importance and feasibility as well that we would not really take it into account when we want to create a framework of quality indicators for learning analytics. So what we drew from these kind of maps is that basically uh, a big focus needs to be on the middle belt of outcome and support because this seems to be very important to people. And another focus should also be on the data privacy or anything data related and especially anything student related. So this is kind of like the, the middle and eastern view. And if you look at it from a north-south perspective, you have the big data thing on top and in the middle you have the processes kind of related things and on the bottom you have the human related um, things. So we, we decided to come up with a five-step um, framework of quality indicators. The first one, we, uh, we take the two clusters about data and combine them and say, okay, this uh, is our layer about data features. Then because the support cluster was such a big issue, we left it on its own and said, okay, this is another issue that is very important. Uh, third one is the one about outcome and we left this alone as well. And then we combined the, the bottom ones about humans or any uh, human related thing uh, into um, educational aims. And because uh, from this kind of view, we are kind of missing anything that is con connected to organizational or company input or um, in uh, quality indicators for them, we created a fifth cluster and took some of the statements that are in that cluster we originally threw out because we thought it's just one aspect that is very important and that shouldn't be forgotten. So the framework we came up with, the first version of it, uh, is this. We have the different layers I just explained and we have some indicators that we took from the statements in those specific clusters that we thought uh, are very the, the most important ones and that um, represent that cluster best and that we think are the quality integrators that people can measure their tools by or their, um, their analysis they are planning to do. So uh, we have the educational aims with awareness, reflection, motivation and change of behavior. So that's the people related uh, indicators. We have learning support, which is uh, perceived usefulness, recommendations, um, activity classification and detection of students at risk, which is a very, very important topic. For the learning outcomes, we have comparability, effectiveness, um, expedience and helpfulness. For data features, we have transparency, a very, very big issue, data standards, control and privacy. And then for the organizational aspects, we picked out the availability, uh, the implementation, training of educational stakeholders and the change of organizational culture. And um, we hope to maybe further develop this a little bit more, but this is the first version of the framework we came up with that uh, people can use to evaluate their tools and analyses of learning analytics that they employ at their institutions. And so the idea from here is basically that you have something like um, I don't know, at the UFA you do something with um, one of the cluster projects you are doing, uh, let's take these learning paths where you look at the alumni people and you look for the others. So it's kind of 
okay, we have as educational aim awareness and reflection of the student towards his goal, his competence, his job he wants to achieve. Then, uh, yeah, learning support would be recommendations. And then the idea is that here are really also items that will be suggested to you. You should take into account to the test that your recommender is working and it provides uh, valuable input. Um, then one of the learning outcomes would be effectiveness towards this goal, to reach that goal, uh, for instance. Um, data features would then, yeah, I guess, data standards, where how you match the alumni data to the student data, that's a big thing. I don't know, transparency of the data. Um, privacy, definitely, for the alumni people. And um, organizational aspects, um, yeah, availability of data, other things. So you, the idea is it's kind of a, like a toolbox where you can pick certain things to you, towards your, your goal and, and create your own evaluation measure, and you can suggest that to your board to, hey, this is the proposal, how we want to evaluate the thing, we, with this project we want to do. I'm a great believer in disrupting organizational mentality uh, because we tend to get into our own group think. So this uh, sort of quality, and I've also come from a quality assurance background, so this sort of uh, uh, quality indicators would help with making the process more objective. So. I'd be happy to suggest that you come and have a look at our processes and uh, give us feedback, for example. Okay, yeah. Well, what 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 motivates a bit this study is exactly what you what you said. So we we have so many different data sets, we have so many different algorithms that work on that data. How we compare any effect from UFA to OUNL that it's working, or do we need an own criteria set to compare that? So how we get to a common language data? You said data is the common language, but we still need to write and to understand, and there's vocabulary and stuff. So. Uh, we kind of want to uh, go one step further with that and um, have a kind of agreement what kind of indicators would be relevant to measure then the impact of that. Well, I think it's coming up to launch, so uh, <laughs> a quick round of applause, I would say. Yeah. The paper of Marin is in submission, it's in submission. and will be submit and accepted soon. Um, so okay. then it will also be on our website and so on. Or we'll just ask her; she will tell you all the insights. But it's we cannot publish these results at the moment uh, until we get the agreement from the publisher. But when that is done, uh, you get more details definitely.